So welcome to the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge uh, monthly program with our theme on climate change. I'm Carney McRae and I do the outreach coordinating with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. So I am delighted to welcome Jill Pelto here tonight. She is a climate change artist. Jill will be showing in our art gallery this summer at the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge Visitor Center in Rockland. Uh, if for some reason we still are not open to the public, uh, we or you can't even get up to see us, we will be doing some virtual tours with our artists so that folks can see their art and even hear from the artists themselves, their stories about their artwork. So without further ado, I am going to get Jill here in the spotlight. And let's see, there we go. And welcome her. Go ahead, Jill, you're on. Hi, thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, so right now I am based in Westbrook, Maine. Um, I've been living in Maine since basically since I came to go to college here in 2011. Um, I went to the University of Maine for my degrees. Um, and so tonight I'm just going to be sharing with you what I am doing right now, early in starting out my career. And that is basically science communication and sharing stories about climate change and doing that largely through my art. But I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about the science work that I did first to kind of give me that background in, in climate change. And so I'll kind of talk about why both of those topics and why I think it's important to share science in all different types of ways. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and give um, like a 20 or 25 minute presentation. And then I'd love to hear from any of you after if you have any kind of questions or comments or anything. So we'll be talking about science communication through my art. So my background is a, as an artist and a science communicator. That's what I'm doing for work right now. The photo of me on the left is my current little home studio space. That's where I'm sitting right now. And so. Um, I don't currently have kind of a separate studio, um, hopefully in the next year or so. Um, but, and that I'll be showing you that painting I'm working on in that photo, um, which is about the Gulf of Maine. And then in the photo on the right, I am in Washington state making a watercolor of the mountain in front of me, um, which is a mountain that, mountain that I work on the glaciers of every August. Oh. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Okay, so I also have an earth and climate science background. And so I received my bachelor's and master's at the University of Maine and in, in earth and climate science. And so that allowed me to do a lot of uh, cool, cool field work in different places in the world um, and really helped me get to learn about the way that our climate has changed on earth over long periods of time. So on the top left, I'm in New Zealand and I'm taking a sample from the top of that boulder um, because that boulder was actually left by a large glacier in the past and the glacier would have covered um, the entire landscape around me. On the top right, I'm working in the Falkland Islands, which for those who don't know are off the tip of South America. And I'm measuring the thickness of that big deposit, which is peat, and learning about when that, when that deposit was left in the past. In the bottom left, I am in Antarctica where I did my master's research and in the bottom right in Washington state where I do research every summer on the mountain glaciers. So to you in terms of science, a little bit about that, about Antarctica and about Washington. Okay, so for me, science means asking questions and looking for answers. And that's something that I love about getting to do all that sort of field work that I showed you, or I like traveling to different places and, and learning about our world. And so my master's work, as I mentioned, was in the Antarctic, um, which was a really spectacular place to work. And the huge kind of overarching question of my work was what will happen to Antarctica as the climate changes and gets warmer? And so by no means with my study was I going to be answering that question, but it's kind of creating another little piece in that puzzle of understanding it. So a good way to understand how Antarctica may change with warming is to study how it changed in the past. And so that's what my research team was doing. 
And so the last ice age on Earth ended approximately 18,000 years ago. Um, it depends on where you are in the world. Um, but in the Antarctic, because it's so isolated in terms of its atmosphere and its ocean circulation, the, it was, the end of the last ice age was closer to about 12,000 years ago. So it was a bit later. And it was at that time that uh, it started to warm down there more and the ice sheet basically got a little bit smaller and retreated a little bit back to where it currently is. And so the question of my research was what happened in Antarctica when it warmed after that time period, after the last ice age. So I included a few images to kind of just show you a little bit where I was. So in the top left image, um, there is a little, there's a map of Antarctica in the, in the bottom left of that image showing where this inset is. And so there's a big mountain range that cuts across the continent called the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And I was working on two glaciers that flow through those mountains. And so I titled them um, Amundsen Glacier and Leaf Glacier. And then I zoomed in on them a little bit more in the top right image. And so that is showing the glaciers from above. Um, and in the top right of that image is the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. So just the huge sheet of ice that's covering the continent. And ice from that is flowing down through those trans mountains as glaciers and into the Ross Ice Shelf, which is basically, as it is described, a shelf of ice. So it's floating and has um, the ocean underneath it. And so then two photos from down on the ground on those sites below. On the left is one of the campsites that I worked at. So we're camped on ice, as you can see, and there's the uh, exposed like Rocky Mountain behind us. And so we were actually studying when that ice that we camped on used to be thicker in the past and would have covered that mountain behind our campsite. And then in the bottom right is just a photo of our team. I'm in the top left. And my master's advisor who works at the University of Maine, Dr. Brenda Hall is to the right of me. And then just one more image to highlight what we were doing in the field a little bit more. And so um, in this photo, this is one of my team members, um, another student, Joel, and, oh, that didn't mean for that to happen quite yet. So basically first, before I do that, I wanted to just like point out in the um, kind of bottom right of the image, there's like that bluer kind of ice. And so that's where like the level of the glacier is right now in this area in Antarctica. And in the past, that ice again would have been a lot thicker and it would have covered a lot of the mountains behind Joel. And there's a lot of evidence that that le leaves on the landscape. And one of those is just rocks that the glacier was carrying that it deposits. And so um, to the right of Joel is that big boulder and it's really different looking than the rest of the surrounding landscape. It's so much more round than the kind of broken apart rock and bedrock that it's on. And it's also a really different color being a lot lighter. And so that just immediately tells us that that rock was transported there um, by ice. And so you can imagine, um, now I'll kind of show you this, when the ice was a lot thicker in the past, you can imagine it covering most of this landscape, um, covering like most of the mountain and carrying a lot of debris in it that would have fallen off onto the ice. And so when it began to thin back down and retreat as the climate warmed, it would have left behind um, deposits like this boulder. And so knowing when that boulder was deposited means we know when the ice thinned back down and when the climate to cause that. And I'm not going to go into today how we find out that information because that's just a little bit more to go over, but it was really cool to get to do this sort of research and just figure out um, how Earth's climate has changed over time in natural ways as well. So now I'm gonna jump to somewhere a little bit closer to home in Washington state and talk a little bit about the research that I do there. And so this research is with a group called the North Cascade Glacier Climate Project. And that is a project that my dad, um, Dr. Mark Pelto began in 1983 and runs every year. And so the photo on the left is Mount Baker in Washington. It's one of the biggest mountains in the state and it's a volcano. And as you can see in that image, it's completely covered in glaciers, so in snow and ice that are flowing down the mountain. And those glaciers are super, super important water resource in the area. They're important for the ecosystem. 
And so basically what, what I do with my dad's project is go out every single summer and measure specifically how much the glaciers change from year to year. So not only how much do they retreat, but what is the snowpack like from that year? Is it you know good or is it just okay or bad? Um, how much um, is there a new pond that has formed at the end of the glacier? How much is their output into streams affected? And so lots of different questions that we can address and form with this continuous record of change. Um, as you can see in the photo in the middle, we still went out this August as well to keep our continuous record of change in these glaciers. And then in the photo on the right, um, the guy in blue is my, my dad and next to him is a field assistant, Mariah. And so she is taking um, a snow depth with that metal probe she's holding of the remaining snow at the end of the summer that's on this glacier. And you can see kind of behind Mariah, there's that patch of like blue gray. And so that's exposed glacial ice that no longer has snow on it. And so that means that that patch is gonna keep expanding until the snow starts falling again. And these photos are also from Washington. And I included these to kind of talk about how much, uh, I guess the effects of climate change have been really strong and powerful for me there. And I've experienced some of those things as well, certainly um, in New England, but I think they have been a little bit more striking in Washington and, and were earlier on um, in time for me. And so the top two photos are from a lake uh, below one of the glaciers that we work on too. So a glacier um, feeds all of the water into that lake. And you can just see from the top left photo to the top right, um, the haze that came in from one day to the next um, when there was um, a forest fire in the area. And so that's just become a reality of working in the Western United States um, in the summers uh, where they have a lot more periods of severe drought and um, severe heat and resulting forest fires a lot of the summers now. And that's really impactful for us doing field work and camping and hiking for a few weeks to breathe in that air quality. And then the bottom two photos, I just wanted to highlight kind of how different the snow looks between them. So on the bottom left, you can see it's like nice, just kind of bright white, white fresh snow. It looks like, um, yeah, just not, not a lot changed um, since it fell. And then on the bottom right, it, how it's so dirty and covered in debris. And that means it's, it's likely not snow from that winter. It's um, snow from years past. And so there's no more snow left from the winter on that glacier, uh, which it needs to be able to survive. So seeing these effects has been really powerful me, to me, especially because these places have become very personal um, as I've now been working on these same um, glaciers in Washington for 12 years. And this is my final photo um, from field work in Washington. And so this was also taken this summer in August, 2020. And so behind me is the very end or terminus of a glacier. Um, most of it is going out of sight over the horizon. Um, and I'm standing where that glacier used to end when I first started working at this location in 2008, so 12 years ago. And so I think in this photo to me, it was also just really powerful because that's only just over a decade of change. And you can imagine not just the distance of retreat, but the amount of like thickness and ice volume needed for it to pull back that far. Cause the ice isn't thin, it's really thick. Um, and so it's just a lot of loss over those 10 years, let alone a longer time period. And so again, these, the, this experience of working out there for me is what really um, drove me when I was still in college of creating, coming up with uh, my first ideas for making art that incorporated research data into it. So that's what I'm gonna be showing you in just a moment. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot to this. I just um, did a little animation of um, the glacier extending out to where it used to be to kind of show that um, change. So I feel like as a scientist with that field work that I've been showing you that it's really helped me to develop just, you know, how you go out into the field and ask questions and even figure out what to ask and then try to figure out answers to those questions and learn about our world. It's also given me just that background into how our earth and climate system works. And so 
I can understand um, why we have climate changes on Earth over time, and then specifically why um, we as humans are causing climate change now. It also has allowed me to learn about the, the traditional ways that scientists have communicated for a long time. So um, through giving research talks, through presenting posters at conferences, um, through creating publications um, and, and making data for those publications. And so those are a lot, a lot of really great and traditional ways that they've shared their work. As an artist, I think the skill sets I've developed are definitely overlapping, but they can be a little bit different as well. And so I was have been more encouraged to develop um, that creative skill set that helps me tell stories in artwork. I've gained a background into not just the technical side of art, but also how to actually incorporate something complex into what I make. And then it's allowed me to really learn about how art can be such a powerful way to communicate by using, um, at least in the sense of like 2D or 3D art, by using visuals and um, thinking about the way that you compose a, a work to tell a story. And I think those aspects give it that strong uh, ability to incorporate emotion and how people have an emotional takeaway to the topic that you make art about. So in combining art and science, what I have been working towards is pairing that in, important um, science research and information with the visual imagery of art and in doing so hope to create that more emotional response to the science research that can sometimes be, um, can be difficult to get if you're just looking at a science paper or data. And so in combining the science and art, I'm hoping to share environmental stories that's a little bit easier for people to relate to or, or just different types of people can relate to. Certain people, for some people, the science is the perfect thing. So science research has always inspired my art and that started out for me largely of just bringing things with me like watercolors and colored pencils. When I would go do that field work I showed you, I've always brought a little kit with me with a sketchbook and things um, to Antarctica, to Washington, everywhere. And so these of course are um, paintings that I created once I had built up like my technical skill set as an artist, but um, I would just paint what was in front of me and paint the research that we were doing. Um, and so this was my way to like sit and observe in a way that was separate from the science work a little bit, but also connected to it. And so what I'm doing now is um, using science data and putting that directly into my artwork. And so this is the very first painting um, there on the right that I made that incorporated graphical data and so this painting came from those, specifically those experiences that I talked about in Washington, where um, specifically in 2015, um, that is my personal worst experience with um, the severe, the se se a really severe year of um, forest fire and drought out there. And it just made the whole field season very tough and emotional to see how badly the glaciers were doing um, and to see how low the streams and, and reservoirs were and to be kind of stuck in a lot of forest fire smoke. And so when I came back to Maine in, in the fall of 2015 after that work, this was the first painting that I made. And so now focusing on the, the graph line on the left, this is the data behind the piece. And so just paying attention to the, the, the dark blue graph line, this is just basically showing the lot, the amount of ice loss on the glaciers in Washington over time. So on the y-axis is annual mass balance in millimeters of water equivalent. And so mass balance is just the budget of the glaciers every year. So how much snow they gain in the winter versus how much they lose from melt in the summer. So when, that, when they melt more than they gain, of course that budget is gonna be negative. And so that's what's happening almost every year. And then on x-axis is the time frame for this which is 1984 to 2014. So 30 years showing how much these glaciers have been losing. And um, we have data up until present, but I made this painting, as I said, when I came back in 2015. So this was the data available at the time. And so my goal in this painting, the painting was to 
incorporate that graph line directly into the work to show much de how, show specifically and exactly like how much decline there was. And then I painted the glacier underneath the graph line and used the colors to kind of represent as well um, how the glacier was retreating. So I have more like kind of the gray at the bottom meant to be like the debris on the glacier as it retreats. Um, but I still wanted to also with my colors and the patterns that I used show the like beauty of the glacier and how much it, it meant to me. And this is just an updated animation of the data line through 2019 showing how much uh, the glaciers continue to lose and how much faster that's happening now. And so this first painting on the left, I'm just showing photographs that kind of correlate with, with the emotions. And so um, that first painting about glaciers, right after making that, I made two more that were part of that series. So the painting in the middle was about the forest fires that um, were in the state. And the data in that painting is um, temperature change, global temperature change over time. So just correlating um, heat with um, forest fires. And then the painting on the right is reflecting on how low um, water levels were that summer in the drought. And so the, the data in that piece is um, the species that are the population of the coho species of salmon over time. Um, and the salmon, salmon in general really rely on um, water temperatures to be low. And they also need the the water levels to be high enough for them to travel upstream and spawn to survive. So now I'm going to show a few more examples of more recent data art that I have been making. And this is a painting that I finished um, just this December. And this one is about the Gulf of Maine. And so I wanted to tell the story um, a kind of a complex story, but largely focused on sea level rise in this painting. Um, and so I incorporated two types of data, which I'll describe, but I included a beach house in this to represent coastal infrastructure in Maine. And I also have the house in, in near a um, coastal marsh that's in front of it. Um, and I wanted to include both of those, both of those things because they'll be, they are both really vulnerable and um, threatened by sea level rise. And so the, the graph line that's in blue is sea level rise from 1880 to present. And I believe that is about eight to nine inches of rise over that time period globally. And the present is where the continuous line ends and it splits up into three um, dashed lines. And those dashed lines represent the three most likely scenarios for the amount of sea level rise through 2100. And so the bottom line is another eight inches of rise over 80 years. The middle line is another 19 inches over that time period. And the top line um, kind of dramatically goes off the page and you can't even see where it ends because it's another 47 inches of rise. And so you can see in that how dramatically different these scenarios are based on how our world, world responds to what's going on and based on how much action we take. So it just highlights how critical it is that we do take action now. And to kind of somewhat combat how I think overwhelming that, that data is, but important to recognize, I included another type of data, which is the bar graph in the background that's behind the house. And so that bar graph is showing that uh, increase in renewable energy consumption in Maine over the last few decades. Um, and so that there has been growth, I think it looks like there's less growth in, in recent years, um, but hopefully that's something that will continue to really increase. Um, and this bar graph has a few different colors because it's a stacked bar graph. And so the darker green is representing renewable energy consumption from biomass. The me, uh, medium green color above that is from hydropower. And then there are little caps on top that represent little pieces um, from solar panels, from uh, wind energy, and from uh, a little bit from geothermal. And then the last piece I thing I want to touch on about this is that included um, a solar panel on the house. And that was to kind of touch on the kind of individual role of a lot of people 
um, in Maine to make more sustainable changes to their lifestyle. And so a solar panel is just a good like physical example of that effort. Um, and I think that it's really awesome and, and necessary that we all that we all do change as a society to be more sustainable. Um, but I also wanted to include that to kind of at least personally comment on um, that it's really not the individual change that we most need. It's of course the government and big industry change. So this, this is another painting that I completed a couple years ago that's also about the Gulf of Maine, but with a different focus. And so the data in this painting is meant to be like the top surface of the ocean and it's showing the temperature change in the Gulf of Maine over the last 15 years. And so the story that I wanted to tell in this piece was how um, warming temperatures are affecting um, different species in the ocean here. And I think the story is also not just in the temperature rise, but in how um, much more it fluctuates now. So from what I've learned in the past, the increases and decreases in ocean temperature were a lot more cyclical and slow. And now in that data, you can see how much more quickly up and down those temperature changes are, which is just difficult for species to, um, I would, at least I, I would think, um, be able to learn how to adapt to. And so I chose species that I hope were representative of different stories in our ocean. There's so many different ones I could choose, of course. Um, but the fish are meant to be cod, and I have them disappearing across the painting as they've been uh, largely overfished. And I chose um, shrimp, which I know you also some years can't catch when they're not doing well. Um, lobster, which of course are such a representative species here, but um, from my understanding, their species, their, their future is a little bit murky um, as they need certain water temperatures to do well. And then in the sand are soft shell clams um, burrowing in. And I know that they are really susceptible to um, the chemistry changes in the ocean that will come along with temperature changes. And then I also included a um, fishing boat to kind of comment on the role that we play in sustainability. Um, of course, the fishing industry is so important here. And so thinking about the stresses these species will face with climate change and considering that in fishing practices. And then I just included some process images on the right um, of how I make my work. So starting really simple with sketches, um, coming up with my final idea that way. And then the three images on the bottom are showing my progression. So first I make that final detailed sketch and I paint right on top of that and go like from different color areas at a time. So I just have a, a couple more slides. Um, this one I want to use to just comment on all the different ways that we communicate about science specifically. And so in the top left is just a screenshot of the website for the, the North Cascade project that I talked about in Washington. And so you can just see on that website page, there's access to lots of different things you can look at the scientific publications and read the specific numbers behind our research. You can do more reader friendly, um, like general audience reading about the glaciers and how they're doing. You can look at photos, you can look at information on wildlife in the area. Um, so it's just lots of different tools for communication altogether. And so then to the right of that, I just have a photo. And I think um, we, we obviously take a lot of photographs of the field work that we do and and use that to story tell and communicate. And sometimes journalists come out with us and, and take photos and, and write about uh, what we do as well. Um, and to the right of that, the top right, again, another watercolor I did just directly depicting um, what I was seeing in the field as we worked on the glaciers and showing their size. So those are all different ways for me to, or for us to share the work that we do in different ways. And then in the bottom left, I just wanted to show the progression of science to art. And so that's a screenshot on the, the left of one of those publications of research that are available online. And then to the right of that, again, the data that that research has created over um, many decades. And that data then lending itself to the painting that I created on the right. 
So I just wanted to highlight in this how many different ways there are to communicate. And um, I think that they just speak to different people and different audiences. And so they're all really important in their own, in their own methods. I also do outreach about these about all different topics with students. I largely focused on the environment, but if their schools want to do something different, um, that's good as well. But I basically just um, have the students either choose their own data. If they're older, if they're younger, I can bring in um, graphs for them and have them um, basically make art on the graphs themselves about topics that they care about. And that allows them to do something in interdisciplinary where they're doing math and science and then they're getting to use the creative side of themselves to be like, okay, but this is why I care about this topic and this is how I wanna show it. So I think it just helps um, different students with different interests um, kind of all have something for them in that project. And, and it also has been really um, inspiring and gives me a lot of hope to just see what they do care about, what they do make and how creative they are with it. Um, and I get a sense of understanding and deep care about climate change from the students, all the students I work with in Maine. And then this is just another example of the way that I can kind of promote um, promote my work, um, but also just promote these topics. And so I have my work on a pair of skis and so it's cool for um, a conversation of someone who's wearing them about climate change and snow sports. And then just a few examples of um, some uh, book and, and journal covers and a t-shirt that I have my work on. Um, and I forgot to include the, the cover of Time Magazine that I was on in this spread I thought I, I, thought I had. Um, but just getting to see like, uh, this is, for me, this tells me that this um, art or this way of communicating science is something that people are responding to um, as something that is different and another way to talk about these topics um, and in a way that I think can be more, more emotional for people. So the takeaways for me are that different media can really communicate different types of complexities um, within science. And so I think it's been important for me to learn about what the kind of, you know, loose boundaries are of, of them. And so what audiences it are the arts for versus like journalism versus you know science data or school outreach and those aren't like again strict boundaries but they do reach different people better and I think the art side of things has allowed me to reach a little bit of a broader audience than the science perhaps um, even though I think they're there it the science is necessary for my art and equally important and so number two I think the art is one of those really powerful ways to communicate because um, it it can connect people about these topics and um, through the art give it a cultural impact and I think that it can tell those stories about science in emotional ways and so for some people that might make those stories um, more relatable whether they've experienced those effects of climate change themselves or not and I hope that it might also um, make them feel a little more comfortable with Kind of asking questions about about those topics and they may, maybe they would um, at a science talk. Um, thank you so much for listening. I am going to um, stop sharing my screen now and would love to speak with any of you or uh, speak with you all and answer any questions you might have. So if anybody does have questions you can type them into the chat box and that is the little bubble that's um, should be on the bottom if you're using a laptop and you can just type them in there. If for some reason you can't uh, figure that out, we'll take the ones in the chat and then we'll give a few minutes if people wanna unmute and ask a question. So I'm gonna go to the chat box first and we've got someone saying, love seeing the process images from the idea to the final painting. Not a question, but a comment to you. Uh, so interesting to see how data can be incorporated into art. Uh, here's a question. Are you using mostly watercolor? Yes, I, I use mostly watercolor um, and I usually do some colored pencil as well. Um, I just use watercolor because it's the media that I feel like I can express myself the best with. And I, I think that largely came from um, by the time I was in high school and getting, um, getting to go out and do some science work. I 
would that was like the most accessible thing to bring with me you know camping because it's so lightweight and packs down really tiny so I just bring watercolors and I feel like I got you know good with them so that's been my favorite favorite media since here's another comment so fabulous so glad to get to hear you tell your stories of process alongside seeing your art uh, a question a beautiful images in science what are your future research plans and what are your future data art plans <laughs> Yeah, so I would say I've now diverged into science communication and I'm not actively doing working as a scientist anymore now that I finished my degrees. And so um, in terms of research, I think I'll kind of come on as an assistant or on a project that I'm making art about. So I hope to still do field work and I'll still be going to Washington as that's my dad's project. Um, but I think I'll be yeah focusing on on making art and science communication and the the data art that I am working on right now is about how plant species have to adapt to climate change. And that's not a topic that I'm an expert in. So I'm collaborating with a science research team. I'm on their grant. So I'm getting funding to make a series of art for them about their research topic. Um, but I have tons of different other ideas for the future. And I, I wanna make a few more paintings about um, positive changes and things that people are doing too. We have another comment, impressive talk, Jillian. I love the combination of art and science, the outreach to children, thank you. And here's one, how to reach you reworking with students. Oh yeah, um, yeah, definitely reach me at my email. That's how I usually set that up. Um, and my email is, is my name, basically it's pelto.jill at gmail. Um, tell okay. me if you want me to spell that out. You could also put it in the chat box too. Um, I'll do that. Yeah. And you can always reach out. If you can't reach her, you can reach out to me at info at maincoastislands.org and I can put you in touch with Jill as well. Okay, here's another one. Jill, I have a student who is a budding artist who I have shown your art to for a couple of years. And while I think she is skilled in her art and can effectively communicate with it, she says that she sucks what words of encouragement can you suggest for me to encourage her to explore her skill and brave sharing it? Yeah, I feel like, um, I think that for me, as I, I think when I was a younger artist, like that technical skill, I really cared about, like, you know, could I, you know, make something realistic or not? But I think now um, I really admire all different types of art more. And I think for me, it's, it's more about like the creativity. It's not really how technically good you are at art. It's more the story that you're telling. So I think that maybe if she focuses more, you know, I have no idea how good she is or not, but if she focuses more on just what is her, what does she love to make and and what is what are the stories that she loves to make work about? And if that's powerful, then I think her work is powerful. And kind of similar along the line, what advice would you give to a young artist middle school age that is interested in art and science? Ooh, um, I would encourage you to go paint or what, whatever medium you like um, outside or even do little trips where you go somewhere and, and observe what's around you. I think for me, that was a really great thing for getting started to just think about you know, what, whatever kind of environment you live in and make work directly of that. So, or looking up topics online um, that interest you that you can make work about, maybe some of both. Okay. Uh, here's another one. You're awesome, Jill. I have a three word question. Are you hopeful? Oh yeah, definitely. I'm very hopeful. I, I consider, I, I'm, I want to always be realistic about the climate change that's going to occur, um, you know, during my lifetime and beyond. And I think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of severe changes, but I have a lot of hope for um, the, the positive things that will come out of that and the actions that people are being forced to take. And of course, I wish those actions were happening a lot faster, but I have seen, I feel like a lot of good come out of it. And I sometimes, I feel that those stories are not really given the amount of attention that they deserve, um, you know, anywhere in any sort of like kind of news outlet or anything. Um, and so I think there are a lot of those really cool solutions and um, inventions or 
um, different changes in lifestyle that people are, are undergoing right now as a result. And so that, that gives me hope. And the younger, seeing the action of, of those kids I'm visiting gives me hope as well. Thank you. So here's another one. I love how your knowledge of science leads to art, which connects your audience with science. Do you have tips for getting students to use the artistic process to gain a deeper understanding of the data or science they are using to create art? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I feel like I lost that question as it came to me. Okay. Do you um, have tips for getting students to use the artistic process to gain a deeper understanding of the data or science they are using to create art? I, yeah, I think that, I think I've seen students really do that on their own. Um, just like, that's why a lot of times I've, students have, have chosen the topic that they, is something that they care about. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I help out, but I'm not like their, their teacher guiding them through the entire thing. I'll, I'll kind of check in um, with different students. But um, I think that once they often kind of get their brain working on um, what that is that like, you know, makes them, you know, feel a strong emotion that they kind of tap into that creative part of it. And so just getting them to think about what's the story that you see here and, you know, why does that story matter to you? Um, here's one. I love how you found hope in the sea level renewable energy image. Have you ever come across data that was too hard to represent? And if so, where did would you draw ha huh, the line? I imagine <laughs> if you go too dark, it stops being as accessible. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, the way that climate change is often communicated can be, I think, a little you know, people want it to be alarmist to get people to notice, but I think that also shuts us down and makes make it, makes us feel like we can't do anything about it, um, and that and and gives people I know anxiety. And so, um, I think that I've definitely been conscious of that, especially in recent years with the topics that I choose. I don't think there's ever been something that I've I've said like I wouldn't show this. I think the most difficult topics would be. Um, if I were to introduce people more strongly into the story and, and were to, if I were to make like a painting about, um, you know, people like uh, climate change imp impacting where people live, like people having to um, already, you know, migrate and um, people in parts of the world who don't have a lot being so strongly affected. I think those would be really difficult to make pieces about, although very important. Um, but I haven't kind of gone down that path of in including people as much in my stories yet. So a couple more comments of such inspiring work, really great work, so necessary. So how far in advance do you need to plan to work for organizations or publications if someone is interested in working with you? Yeah, thank you. I think that um, I, I usually need a bit of time. I would say like at least a year out, like for example, this year I already have kind of like my all my projects lined up and the years just started. Um, and I have a couple other potential projects for the future. And, and I just think my art, especially right now, I'm actually not, I'm still not able to do art full time. And so um, I can't produce art um, that quickly. It usually takes me a few months to do a painting. And so I don't want to overcommit. And um, so, yeah, I think at least a year. Okay. Uh, another question, which I'll have to answer, where did you say this recording will be posted? And so that will be on the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands YouTube channel. Uh, and I, I'll always put a link in our e-news that we send out. If for some reason you can't find it, just email me again at info at maincoastislands.org and I will send you a link. Um, so here's another one. I'm an elementary art teacher and speak with my students a lot about environmental issues. I would love to somehow introduce your work to my students. Is there a way I can share what you do with them via the internet? Um, well, I have a website. Um, I'm going to type it in. It's just my name, jillpalto.com. I just put it in the chat. Um, on my website, I do have a, um, a tab like called Outreach. And I have some information on that about um, the work that I do with students. And I have a link there too, to like the a science art activity. Um, but yeah, that, that website and, and anything on it. Um, and then you can also contact my email, which is on, on my website as well. 
Great. And here's a good question. How much text do you use to accompany the paintings to give the full scientific impact? Yeah, it's a good question. I I usually have a, like, yeah, a paragraph and on my website, I have that too. If you click on any of the work, I have a little paragraph description. And then I also have um, the links um, to the websites of all the data so that people know like this is what the data is and it's really, you know, accessible um, and they can see that it's like real data. Um, and so uh, I, when I show them, yeah, like in galleries and things, I'll have that little paragraph of text because I do want people to be able to learn about the topic if, if they're interested in engaging further in it. Great. Here's a comment. Thanks so much for presenting and for the work you do. Would love to see if you can start to incorporate natural dyes as the next level of harmonizing digital data with the natural world. Be well. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing and inspiring with your uh, co communication art, both informative and beautiful. Um, did you have that other question that someone sent in earlier via email? Did that get answered? Um, I tried to address that. I think it was about okay. um, about do I reach a broader audience through my art, and I think I think it can be broader, and I think it can just be different than the science and and the people who will have access to the science, but also be able to you know read it and and understand it well enough to have that takeaway. Right. Um, I have uh, taken all the questions from the chat. Is there someone who wasn't able to put something in the chat that would like to speak up? You can unmute and just ask your question. I just like to say it was a wonderful presentation and good luck with your art. And I love that you're crossing disciplines and, and reaching out, especially to children. Thank you so much. That means a lot to hear. And just a re reminder that we will have um, Jill's artwork up in the art gallery in the Rockland Visitor Center this summer. So you'll have a chance to look at it much closer than on a Zoom screen. Uh, Nicole, did you have a question? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Hi. Um, yeah, that uh, that email. Thank you for responding to my email. Um, I, I was also wondering if you know how what kind of a response do you get from adults in terms of your art? And um, do you think that it has impacted them as much as it is obviously impacting um, children? Thank you. Yeah, I think that um i think it has for for certain people like the people that it, that it does speak to and i assume that like most of the people who adults who like my work are those who you know do do already care about the environment and so you know it would obviously be great if anyone i don't know who doesn't care about the environment but like someone who didn't you know say like understand climate change or believe in it if they saw it and were were impacted but i think like realistically it's obviously going to be usually people who are you know, like-minded and, mm -hmm. um, but I have, yeah, I have gotten a lot of that. And um, I think like an evidence here tonight and um, I sell like prints of my work and just all the comments I get from from people who, who like, you know, buy it or just kind of comment on it um, is really wonderful. And I've gotten some really cool like emails along those lines too. Um, so I think, I think for, yeah, like certain people who, who really respond to it, um, it has really been something powerful for them, I think. Yeah, I think that um, art is a is a medium in which you can connect more with people um, and not be as intimidating as some scientific data can be to some people and still, you know, provide the same message, give the same message. And I think it's great what you're doing to hopefully be able to reach more a wider audience like you're like you're doing. Yeah. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a question that just came in, what was the response to the Time Magazine article? Um, that was really great. I I pretty much got all positive responses to it, not too much um, against it. And um, yeah, it, it was really great for me um, just to hear that the fact that Time wanted to include, you know, science art or climate change art on its cover kind of just tells me a lot about um, what people respond to and kind of where, where some of us are at in terms of um, wanting to tackle that. And so um, the response that I got was was really awesome and it's been really helpful for my career and, and inspiring. And, and then lastly, it also just connected me with a lot of 
other cool people who are doing types of science communication and, and other artists who are doing so as well, who, who reached out to me after. And here's a very important question. Where can we purchase your prints? Um, my prints are currently on, on Etsy. Um, I can include a link if you like, but the, there's also a link on my website. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll just direct you there so I, I don't have another. Um, so yeah, jillpelto.com and um, there's a link to my Etsy and that's where I sell um, prints and they're all um, done on water archival watercolor paper, um, like fine art paper so that they look like the originals. Right. So does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Well, Jill, I really want to thank you for zooming in with us tonight. Uh, your art is phenomenal and the blending of science with art is, is just incredible. And lots of comments of people who are saying thank you, inspirational. Uh, and uh, we, I look forward to seeing you in our art gallery this summer. And again, thank you everybody for zooming in and hope to see you at some of our future uh, presentations. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining everyone and all your questions. <laughs> have a good night.